Bom dia a todos e todas. É com grande satisfação que a Casa de Oswaldo Cruz, o seu Departamento de Pesquisa em História das Ciências e da Saúde, iniciam hoje, e o Programa de Pós-Graduação em História das Ciências e da Saúde, iniciam hoje a segunda edição do curso sobre História, Ambiente e Conhecimento no Antropoceno, que tem como objetivo apresentar e discutir as principais implicações do conceito de antropoceno nas ciências humanas e sociais. Este ano, nós mantivemos a estrutura elaborada na primeira edição do curso, que ocorreu em maio de 2019, só que totalmente de forma virtual, devido às restrições impostas pela pandemia da Covid-19. Eu gostaria de agradecer a participação dos professores convidados, que gentilmente aceitaram o convite e que, com certeza, vão nos trazer ótimas reflexões sobre essa que estamos organizando, que estamos considerando agora como uma nova época geológica. Agradeço também as equipes de informática e de comunicação da Casa de Oswaldo Cruz, assim como a Secretaria do Programa de Pós-Graduação em História das Ciências da Saúde, que foram sempre incansáveis no atendimento pleno para que a organização deste curso fosse realizada com sucesso. Organizado por mim, Magali Romero Sá e André Felipe Cândido da Silva, contamos também com a colaboração dos professores e pesquisadores da COP, Dominique Miranda de Sá e Gabriel Lopes Anaia, que estarão conosco durante as aulas, auxiliando as per nas perguntas que poderão ser feitas através do chat do YouTube. As perguntas poderão ser realizadas, feitas em inglês ou português, e vamos atender, tentar atender a todos na medida do possível, respeitando o tempo de duração da aula. Para abrir o nosso curso, temos a, o grande prazer e satisfação de contar com a presença do professor John McNeil, da Georgetown University, que um colega, o André Felipe, para a apresentação em seguida. Eu desejo a todos que estão conosco neste curso virtual que aproveitem ao máximo e que tenham um excelente curso. Eu vou passar a palavra agora para André Felipe Plantes da Silva para fazer uma apresentação do curso e do professor John McNeil. Welcome, John. I'm glad to have you here. André Felipe, passo a palavra agora para você. Bom dia a todas e todos que estão aqui conosco. É com muita alegria que a gente abre a segunda edição do minicurso História, Ambiente e Conhecimento no Antropoceno. É, quero agradecer muito à Casa de Oswaldo Cruz, Magali, que está organizando comigo esse curso, a todos vocês que estão aqui inscritos, que estão aqui conosco. Serão quatro dias de trabalho intenso, né, de aulas, é... e é uma grande satisfação. Eu quero agradecer também ao Programa de Pós-Graduação em História das Ciências da Saúde, do qual eu faço parte, ao Departamento de Pesquisa, e reiterar meus agradecimentos também à equipe de comunicação, à equipe de informática, que fez o trabalho de divulgação e que está possibilitando que esse curso ocorra online. Né? É... Então, a, é, nós, eu vou falar brevemente do professor John McNeil, é, e passo a palavra a ele, é uma grande honra é, tê-lo apresentando aqui o nosso curso, né, é, queria dizer que, a, a, infelizmente, né, a aula dele será proferida em inglês, depois ela vai ficar disponível no YouTube da Casa de Oswaldo Cruz e nós vamos é, é, providenciar legendas em português, então elas ficarão legendadas para aqueles que tiverem interesse depois ou tiverem alguma dificuldade de, 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 de acompanhar, depois elas ficarão legendadas em português, né. É, o professor John McNeil, ele é, é, dispensaria apresentações, ele é professor da Georgetown University e ele tem um papel muito importante no debate sobre o antropoceno na história, né? ele é um dos principais representantes da história ambiental, né? é, tem uma ampla produção de em livros e artigos que eu não vou detalhar aqui, mas eu gostaria de dar destaque é, algumas obras, é, particularmente Something New Under the Sun, que é uma história ambiental do século XX, que ele publicou em 2000. E a obra que, é, é, para a gente, particularmente a Casa Oswaldo Cruz, é bastante interessante, que é Musk for Empires, Ecology and War in the Greater Caribbean, é, que publicou em 2010 e que fala particularmente do papel da malária e da febre amarela nos conflitos militares do Caribe. E o mais importante, que é o livro que ele publicou em 2014, em coautoria com Peter Engelke, The Great Acceleration and Environmental History of the Anthropocene Since 1945. Né? No livro em que ele desenvolve esse argumento de que 
a intensificação de dinâmicas das sociedades humanas a partir do pós-segunda guerra, sobretudo a partir dos anos 50, quando houve um sério crescimento econômico, populacional, de uso de energia, de vários indicadores é, é, políticos, sociais e econômicos, né, de que é, é, essas modificações elas estão na raiz dos processos, da, das mudanças de processo do sistema Terra, responsáveis, por sua vez, por um esse novo estado de coisas a qual está sendo proposto o nome de antropoceno. Né? Então, o, o professor McNeil ele tem um papel bastante importante na defesa deste marco né, dos anos 50 como início dessa nova época geológica, caracterizada exatamente pelo, pela ação humana no planeta. É, é importante também enfatizar que, junto com a historiadora das ciências Neil Mioreskis e pesquisadores de outros campos disciplinares, o professor John McNeil compõe o grupo de trabalho do Antropoceno, né, o Antropocene Working Group, que é encarregado exatamente de acompanhar os estudos é, relativos à formalização dessa nova época geológica junto à Comissão Internacional de Estratigrafia, que é o corpo de especialistas que vai arbitrar, que arbitra geralmente a definição de novos períodos geológicos. É, bem, então é, é, é uma honra muito grande a gente ter o professor John McNeil aqui abrindo o nosso curso, é, reiterar que os comentários, né, como a Magali já disse, os comentários, as perguntas podem ser feitos em português no nosso chat e a gente vai fazer um esforço de traduzir e passar as perguntas para o professor John McNeil depois que ele concluir sua fala. With that, I am now pleased to hand over to Professor McNeil. You are with the word, Professor McNeil. Thank you very much for the acceptance of our invitation. Thank you, André. Um, for that uh, kind introduction. The little of it that I could understand sounded very generous. I also enjoyed seeing the black cat behind you. So good morning, bom dia. I apologize for the fact that I will be speaking in English. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot do this in Portuguese. My topic is, uh, as Andre said, the Anthropocene. I'm going to speak for perhaps 40 minutes uh, in a, an effort to introduce the, the term and the concept and some of the debates that surround the subject of the Anthropocene. So I'll now uh, share my screen, and I hope that you can now see my first slide that says Introduction to the Anthropocene Concept and Debates. So um, all I will say here is uh, the picture is a joke. Um, in our city of Las Vegas here in the United States, the gambling Mecca. Uh, we have a sign that says, welcome uh, to fabulous Las Vegas. Well, uh, that's the basis of this joke. Here's the outline of what I hope to do today. Uh, I'll explain uh, the content of the concept of the Anthropocene uh, as I see it, and then review some, not all, of the important debates surrounding both the term and the concept. Uh, and along the way, you will get an idea of what I think about the term and the concept, but I'll also try to explain what uh, some other people and other intellectual communities think about it. So, the first thing to understand is that the Anthropocene uh, doesn't officially exist. It is a proposed new interval of geological time. Uh, and that Interval might be an epoch, might be an era. If you look at this representation of geological time here, which begins 
here and ends here in the Holocene epoch, which is the last 11,700 years. Um, perhaps the, Holoc the Anthropocene should be understood as an epoch. Perhaps it should be understood uh, as a period or an era. Um, these nest one inside uh, each other. All that remains to be determined by geologists. The term was uh, popularized by a Dutch atmospheric uh, chemist uh, who died recently, uh, Paul Crutzen, um, 21 years ago at an international science meeting uh, in Mexico. And since that time, the term Anthropocene has grown in popularity in the scientific community, in social science communities, uh, in humanities communities, and in journalism and the uh, general public. In addition to that, the geologists have agreed to formally consider whether or not the Anthropocene should be added to their official uh, international uh, timescale. And they formed this Anthropocene Working Group, which Andre mentioned. Uh, I happen to be a member of it, even though I'm not a geologist. And in 2016, the Anthropocene Working Group formally proposed that yes, uh, the Anthropocene should be recognized as uh, an interval of geological time. And that proposal is still under consideration by the relevant authorities in the International Union of the Geological Sciences. What the Anthropocene Working Group proposed specifically is an Anthropocene that should be understood to have begun sometime around 1945 or 1950. But as I'll uh, explain shortly, there are many other ideas about the appropriate birthday of the Anthropocene. So here's another representation, uh, a more official one of the international chronostratigraphic uh, chart. Um, this is as it stood uh, in uh, March of 2020. It's always being revised and tweaked uh, in very small ways. Um, so the subset of geologists who control this are called stratigraphers. They pay attention to the strata uh, in the earth or in glaciers. Uh, and by studying that, they divide up the history of the earth into uh, intervals of time. Uh, and that's appropriate that stratigraphers should be the ones responsible for um, formalizing uh, earth history. But the Anthropocene has escaped the control of the stratigraphers and it's under discussion in many, many different scientific fields. Um, but ultimately, if it is to be uh, genuinely recognized as part of geological time, that will be the result of decisions made primarily by stratigraphers. So the version that the Anthropocene Working Group recommends, which may or may not be officially adopted, uh, the post-1950 version of the Anthropocene uh, emphasizes either the Earth's governing biogeochemical cycles, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle, the water cycle are the most important ones. And this is a perspective adopted by a community known as earth system scientists uh, who want to regard the earth and life on earth and the uh, atmosphere as one 
big interacting system composed of subsystems. And many Earth system scientists argue in favor of a post-1950 Anthropocene on the basis of what has happened in the last 70 or 75 years to these biogeochemical cycles. But they also argue, and in this they're joined by people from outside the earth science, earth system science community, they also argue that a basket of global environmental variables leads to the same conclusion, that the earth's environment has been radically transformed by human action since the middle of the 20th century. And this basket of variables approaches is most closely associated with the Australian scientist, uh, Will Steffen, uh, whose work I will show you in uh, just a moment. But that work is, is um, summarized by this particular graph that may be difficult for you to see here, uh, but what it shows is a, a handful of variables, uh, some of which are driving forces behind global environmental change, some of which are indicators of global environmental change, such as atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations or species extinctions. And the great majority of them show a point of inflection around the middle of the 20th century, which is here on this graph, 1950. I'll show you in more detail in just a moment the um, approach that Will Steffen and his Earth Systems Science colleagues take. But before I do, I want to emphasize that in this vision, the Anthropocene is not to be understood as the beginning of human impact on Earth, on Earth history, on the global environment, or on biogeochemical cycles. It's not the beginning, it is rather a turning point, a point of inflection, a point after which human activity exercises a governing role. Um, which is not to say that humans are in control because a great deal of this is accidental. It is the inadvertent, unintended consequence of human actions undertaken for other reasons. This set of uh, graphs is composed by Will Steffen and his colleagues, uh, many of them in um, Stockholm. Uh, to try to give some more detailed understanding of why the middle of the 20th century should be understood as the onset of the Anthropocene. These graphs are sometimes called the Great Acceleration Graphs. Uh, and that's because in the middle of the 20th century, according to Stefan and colleagues, and I agree with them in this, you can see in many variables, a dramatic um, intensification or acceleration in trends of both socioeconomic factors that affect the global environment. And in this graph, they appear here in a sort of salmon pink color, and they include global population, the size of the global economy measured here as GDP, um, the size of the urban population, the total primary energy use, water use, which I'll speak about in detail in just a moment, uh, and several others. And at the same time, according to Stefan and colleagues, a handful of indicators, not driving forces, but indicators of global environmental change. So show approximately the same intensification or acceleration around the middle of the 20th century, including carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, including uh, surface temperatures, 
including ocean acidification, uh, including the reduction in uh, tropical forest area, and so on and so forth. So these are data compiled by earth system scientists mainly. And within the Anthropocene research community, these graphs uh, have a lot of uh, resonance and uh, authority. Now let's turn a little bit more closely to some components of this argument about the importance of the middle of the 20th century. And the first component I want to turn to is uh, water use. So uh, this uh, graph shows uh, global water with freshwater withdrawals, that mainly means freshwater use, since 1900 up to 2014. And you can see here, consistent with the data compiled by uh, Will Steffen, you can see here the middle of the 20th century is a turning point in which the volume of water used uh, increased uh, fairly dramatically. Most of that has to do with agriculture, but it's also a reflection of increased urban uh, water use. And associated with this, um, around the world, dam building accelerated after 1950. It reached a peak in 1968 when one large dam per day was completed. Uh, and actually, Brazil played a significant role in this because, uh, as you all know, under the uh, military dictatorship between 1964 and 1985, uh, Brazil built several very large dams. Uh, but that was part of a global trend in which part Brazil participated. And uh, dam building or, or around the world is a, a, a piece, a part, a component of the Anthropocene. Here you can see the um, rivers around the world that have been uh, long rivers, over a uh, thousand uh, kilometers um, are in the darkest blue, uh, rivers between 500 and 1,000 uh, kilometers are in a less dark blue. For those who are colorblind like me, this, this uh, map is very challenging. Uh, at any rate, the, uh, those are free flowing rivers. And the ones that are red or shades of red are um, dammed up. Um, so you can see here that uh, there are four main areas of the world where rivers, a, a large proportion of uh, rivers, including big rivers, still run free. And uh, Amazonia is one of those uh, areas, together with Northern Canada, Siberia, and uh, Central Africa. But um, in many parts of the world, such as uh, India and Europe and the United States, and uh, the eastern part of Brazil, uh, almost all the sizable rivers are already dammed up um, with all the consequences, uh, biological and uh, hydrological consequences that that entails. And this too is, uh, is it's an indication of the Anthropocene. Um, most of this damming up has taken place since 1950, not all of it. Let's turn from water to energy, which I regard as the most important variable in uh, global environmental history and the most important variable behind uh, the Anthropocene. So this graph shows us a global energy uh, history since 1850. Um, 
and it adds the various um, uh, energy sources, wood, coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, uh, on top of each other. And uh, again, what you see here is that the middle of the 20th century, right around 1950, is a point of inflection uh, in the curve. And that's mainly because of the rapid intensification of fossil fuel use, and within that, especially oil. Uh, Brazil also took part in this global trend, although not as conspicuous a part uh, as it did in the dam building surge of the late 20th century. So if we can believe the uh, American uh, scientist uh, Jaya Sivitsky, who has studied energy use in detail, uh, on a global scale, more energy has been used since 1950 than in the entire Holocene up to 1950. This is an estimate, maybe it can't be completely trusted, but it's plausible, I think. Um, and that gives you some sense of the dramatic expansion of energy use since 1950 and by itself constitutes a good argument for conceiving of the Anthropocene as a post-1950 phenomenon. As you're well aware, one of the implications of a vast expansion of fossil fuel combustion is uh, a change to the chemistry of the atmosphere. This is the so-called Keeling curve. It consists of measurements of carbon dioxide on the top of a mountain in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. And you can see here from 1958 when these measurements began up until uh, this week, May 23rd, uh, what the history of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere has been. And it's remarkably steady since 1960, very slight acceleration around 2000, but no um, reduction in the pace of carbon dioxide buildup uh, in the atmosphere, despite the Paris Accords, despite all the various uh, pledges to reduce uh, carbon emissions. So far, none of it has had any uh, impact uh, on the Keeling curve. And by the way, the, the sawtooth pattern here, uh, that just represents the season uh, because there's more vegetation in the Northern hemisphere uh, there's more carbon in vegetation in the biosphere uh, in the northern summer than in the northern winter. So this is just seasonal uh, yearly variation. Here's the longer term uh, Keeling curve. Now, after 1958, these are observations. Before 1958, these are inferred from ice bubbles, excuse me, air bubbles in ice cores taken from either uh, Greenland or Antarctica that actually go back uh, 800,000 years, as you'll see in a moment. But on this time scale, which is 1700 uh, to the present, you can see more clearly that in the post-1958 Keeling curve, that the middle of the 20th century constitutes something of a point of inflection, an intensification of the pattern of increase, which itself was slightly intensifying from about 1850 onward, which represents the early stages of fossil fuel use uh, and industrialization. And this represents uh, more than anything else, the advent of intensive use of oil around the world. So at different timescales, you see uh, different historical truths 
represented uh, in the Keeling curve. And here you get a very different perspective. This is 800,000 years of atmospheric chemistry history. And you can see that until very recently, the proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, fluctuated between about 180 and about 280 parts per million. Uh, this is the normal band of variation. But um, as we have uh, left the last glaciation, that's this period of history here, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations have increased. And then in the last uh, 150 years, especially the last 75 years, they've increased, increased, increased up to approximately 420 parts per million. This is absolutely unprecedented in the ice core record. And the rate of increase in carbon dioxide concentration uh, is 100 times faster than at the end of the previous glaciation or than in any of these earlier rapid accelerations in carbon dioxide concentration. So what's happening now, totally unprecedented as far as we know, and we know for the last 800,000 years. That is another argument for regarding the last 75 years or so as a new interval in geological time. And it helps to have an 800,000 year perspective when contemplating revising the time scale of geological time. Here um, is a way to link the energy use history to um, human health history, which might be of particular interest uh, to people associated with Fiocruz. Uh, these are recently uh, published uh, data synthesized in a, uh, an article I encountered in The Economist, but the research is done by uh, Vora et al. and published uh, a few months ago in Environmental Research. So what this shows you uh, is the uh, geography of excess deaths uh, due to air pollution, the great majority of which air pollution derives from fossil fuel use. And you can see there's specific hotspots around the world, uh, North India, North China, uh, conspicuous among them, but you can also see that southeastern Brazil, I think this represents the greater Sao Paulo area, uh, is among those global hotspots of excess deaths from um, small particles, PM 2.5. Um, and that, again, is a reflection uh, primarily of fossil fuel use uh, and its impact on uh, our lungs. So let's leave uh, the energy system and fossil fuel use behind for a moment uh, and turn to uh, biodiversity. Here, the argument for an Anthropocene that begins in the middle of the 20th century is less clear. I think when it comes to water use and when it comes to energy use, there's a very good argument for the middle of the 20th century as the birthday of the Anthropocene. With respect to biodiversity loss, uh, the argument is less clear. So uh, many conservation biologists and paleontologists uh, now argue that uh, we are quite likely in the beginning stages of a sixth mass extinction in the history of life on Earth. Here are the other mass extinctions, the most recent of which uh, is probably familiar to you. Uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period, roughly 66 million years ago, as a result of an asteroid impact, uh, 
in Yucatan, Mexico. Um, a large proportion, maybe about 76% of known species went extinct. And the prior episodes were earlier in Earth history um, and in most cases, even more severe. Here's another representation of these mass extinction events and maybe the sixth mass extinction uh, is underway, maybe. Uh, in point of fact, the proportion of species that have gone extinct uh, recently is very small, um, on the order of 1% of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Although proportion that is threatened with extinction is much higher, uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent in uh, each of these categories. But the historical, in geological time, historical extinctions are all greater than 75 percent. So we are a very long way from uh, a sixth extinction. It remains to be seen whether it might. Uh, happen. And uh, if it does happen, it's probably not sharply associated, strongly associated with the middle of the 20th century as a more gradual phenomenon. Uh, many of these extinctions are driven by biological invasions and biological invasions have been taking place in accelerated quantity since the 16th century and the so-called Columbian exchange between the American hemisphere and the Afro-Eurasian old world hemisphere. So in the history of biodiversity loss, the middle of the 20th century does not have quite the same significance that it has in energy history or water history. Okay, let's turn to some uh, debates. I've now tried to explain so far why the Anthropocene Working Group and I tend to regard the middle of the 20th century as crucial, but other people see it differently. So let's turn to that uh, for just a moment. Um, so here are some of the debates that I'm gonna get into. The beginning date, whether or not the Anthropocene should be formalized in geology, whether it's really politics and not science, whether the word is the right word, whether dignifying the Anthropocene with formal recognition will be bad because it will encourage unwelcome actions. I'll get into all of these debates. And I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of open pit mining uh, along the way, like this mine uh, in India. Uh, open pit mines are a conspicuous uh, reminder of the power of humankind to affect uh, the Earth's geology. So that's why I chose these pictures. beginning date. So, as I've said, the Anthropocene Working Group prefers somewhere around 1950. I agree with that. But there are several scholars who argue in favor of what's sometimes called an early Anthropocene. And the leading version of the early Anthropocene is that proposed by uh, the American uh, environmental scientist, Bill Ruderman, who argues that it's really shortly after the beginning of agriculture that human activity so strongly affected the chemical composition of the atmosphere as to change the climate and therefore uh, 
we should understand the Anthropocene as having begun not long after the beginning of agriculture. Um, Rudderman says about uh, 6,000 BCE or 8,000 years ago. And his argument is that clearing of forests for agriculture combined with the release of methane from uh, rice paddy production in East and Southeast Asia was already by 8,000 years ago sufficient to change the climate. It's a very controversial idea. And climatologists, climate historians, environmental scientists are very divided about whether Rudderman is correct. And even if he is correct, should that be taken as the start date for the Anthropocene? Personally, I, I think um, Rudderman is probably exaggerating, but I am no expert uh, in this aspect of um, global environmental history. So that's one important idea. Another is that the Anthropocene should be understood to begin in the aftermath of the Columbian exchange, in the aftermath of 1492, in the aftermath of the bringing together of the American hemisphere and the old world uh, with the formation of a new global economy. And uh, again, changes to uh, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. This view is most um, closely associated with two British geographers, Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin, uh, who for the last uh, three or four years have been arguing for the significance of um, this moment in history in the 16th and 17th century. I think they're totally wrong and they wildly exaggerate the global environmental significance of the integration of the uh, two hemispheres. Uh, and if anyone wants to know why I think that, please ask about it and I'll explain uh, in detail. A third important idea is that the Anthropocene should be understood to have begun with the beginning of industrialization. And this is what Paul Crutzen argued. Uh, he sometimes singled out the date of 1784 because a particular improvement in uh, James Watt's steam engines took place uh, in that year. And th this has some merit, but if you look at the curves of um, If you look at the curves of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, you'll see that James Watt's early steam engines uh, didn't have much immediate impact. It really took another 100 years before you see much of a uh, consequence of uh, early, uh, the early Industrial Revolution. So I, I actually think it's better to understand the early industrial revolution as the proto-Anthropocene, a necessary condition for the beginning of the Anthropocene, but not itself the beginning of the Anthropocene. But in some respects, it's just an argument about, um, almost a philosophical argument about what should constitute the birthday of the Anthropocene, whether it's the the technology and the systems being put in place that would ultimately lead to global environmental change or it's the global environmental change itself. But the Anthropocene Working Group prefers the latter understanding. Uh, although I should say Paul Crutzen uh, was a member of the Anthropocene Working Group himself. So these are disagreements. Um, 
uh, about when the Anthropocene began, and they are disagreements about what actually constitutes the Anthropocene. And a lot of the disagreement comes from the uh, discipline in which scholars and scientists uh, operate and which variables they think uh, are the most important. So uh, paleontologists and conservation biology scientists uh, tend to pay attention to the fossil record, um, but atmospheric chemists tend to pay attention to atmospheric chemistry and so on uh, and so forth. And different scientists privilege different variables and are drawn to different conclusions as a result. One of the awkward facts uh, in stratigraphy is that it's hard to compromise about the beginning dates of a particular uh, interval of geological time. Their tradition uh, is that all these boundaries between intervals of geological time are global. You cannot have, for example, an Anthropocene that begins at one time in Brazil and at another time uh, in Germany. They have to be, as they like to put it, uh, globally synchronous, simultaneous uh, everywhere. So that makes it a little bit harder to come to uh, an agreement about when the Anthropocene might begin. Now, another debate, should it be formalized? This is a debate mainly within geology. And some geologists say, no, it's too soon. We don't know enough. They note, for example, that the Holocene is the shortest epoch in the geological time scale, and it's already 11,700 years old. So how can we have an Anthropocene that's only 70 years old? It's too soon to tell. And it took geologists uh, over 100 years to decide that the Holocene should be recognized as uh, an epoch in geological time. So on that logic, maybe we should wait 10,000 years or a million years because the next glaciation might erase most of the human impact on the global environment. In which case, why should we uh, dignify the global environmental changes that we've seen lately as an interval of geological time if they're going to be so transitory because of the next glaciation. So they argue. Mind you, the next glaciation is likely to be postponed by several tens of thousands of years as a result of human activity, as a result of the uh, loading of the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. But that is a, this is a serious argument amongst geologists. And if the formalization of the Anthropocene fails, this will be the main reason why. Next debate, is this not really science? Is this politics? Many geologists make this argument as well. And they're right in the sense that yes, the arguments about the Anthropocene made by the Anthropocene Working Group, made by many others are political because they do draw attention to the scale, scope and pace of modern environmental change. And they imply that this scale, scope and pace is problematic and that policy needs to address it and try to slow it and mitigate it. And that is political. That doesn't mean, however, that it's not good science. Charles Darwin's science, the theory of natural selection, 
theory of evolution by natural selection. That was good science. It was also political because it challenged reigning mainly religious ideas about uh, how species were created. So there is no necessary contradiction between a political idea and good science. And I think my own perspective is that the Anthropocene is both of those at once. But I underline many geologists object to it because they think it is actually more political than it is scientific. Here's another debate. It's not one so uh, important within geology, but it's important within the social sciences. And that is that the word is the wrong word. A concept may be valid, but Anthropocene has inappropriate implications. The main argument here, which was uh, originated by anthropologists, Swedish anthropologists, uh, is that the prefix anthropo implies a collective responsibility on the part of the human species and that that is incorrect empirically and it is wrong morally because some people have much more responsibility than others for the scale, scope, and pace of modern environmental change. And so people who advance this argument and object to the word Anthropocene have offered all sorts of uh, substitutes, uh, such as the Capitalocene on the grounds that it is capitalists that are primarily responsible for the scale, scope, and pace of modern environmental change. Some people, who prefer uh, to see what they don't want to call the Anthropocene as beginning in the 16th and 17th century, prefer the term Plantationocene on the grounds that it's really the birth of the modern global economy with its Caribbean and Brazilian sugar plantations. That uh, is the decisive turning point. Other people argue that it's men, not women, who are responsible, so we should use the term manthropocene. And there are many, many other ocenes that have been suggested. None of this is all that persuasive to the Anthropocene Working Group because the Anthropocene Working Group is dominated by geologists, dominated by stratigraphers, and they, uh, never consider uh, responsibility when they're naming intervals of geological time. So to them, this seems uh, beside the point. And the term is not uh, inappropriate. If there's going to be a revision to the geological time scale, the word Anthropocene is the word that they're going to use. But in the social sciences, there's a great deal of objection to that. And personally, um, I agree with the proposition that uh, responsibility is by no means with the equally with the entire species. Uh, certainly not. But um, as a practical matter, the term Anthropocene has been out there for 20 years. None of the others have been able to replace it. And I don't expect that they will. Here's another debate. Is recognition of the Anthropocene a bad idea because it's going to encourage unwelcome actions? So there are two main varieties of this argument. One is within conservation biology. There's some in that field, a minority, who argue that maybe there is such a thing as the Anthropocene, but let's not talk about it. Let's not recognize it because what it will do is it will encourage the general public to think there is no nature anymore. Everything has been altered by human uh, impact and therefore the logic of conservation biology 
is weakened. And they might be thinking in the back of their mind, the logic for funding for conservation biology uh, would be weakened, but they don't put it in those terms. Perhaps more important, at least in my view, more important is the argument that talking about the Anthropocene and formally recognizing the Anthropocene invites geoengineering and that this is dangerous. Geoengineering means deliberate attempts to affect uh, the climate system or other biogeochemical cycles through various interventions. Um, the most likely of which is uh, sprinkling uh, aerosols into the stratosphere to deflect sunlight um, and cool the earth. This scares me uh, and it should scare everybody. But I note that the very prestigious science journal Nature uh, uh, earlier this month called for more research uh, in geoengineering. To me, that's, that's dangerous because the more uh, we explore geoengineering, the more acceptable uh, it may become. And I don't like that because of the risk involved. You can never do only what you're trying to do when you intervene in earth systems. You do other things as well, other things that you do not intend. And so it would be with geoengineering. Okay, I've run more than the 40 minutes that I promised, uh, but I'm now gonna bring this to a close. Um, so whether we like the exact term or not, uh, the Anthropocene is uh, here to stay within science, within social science, within the humanities, is not going to be displaced by uh, other words. Right now, the geologists, are, particularly within the Anthropocene Working Group, are trying to find a satisfactory global stratigraphic section and point, colloquially known as a golden spike, and something in the ice or in the rock that will serve as a boundary uh, after which is the Anthropocene and before which is the Holocene. Um, that work will take years. Uh, and there's something like uh, 16 major candidates for the golden spike that are under investigation uh, at the moment. So the geologists are not gonna resolve this uh, for several years yet. But in the meanwhile, scholars, journalists uh, and other people are producing a vast amount of discourse uh, using the term Anthropocene. And interestingly to me, literature and philosophy are the two areas in which the term is most frequently used nowadays. Not geology, not environmental science, although those two disciplines do use it, but they don't use it as frequently as literature and philosophy. Of course, literature and philosophy tend to use it in a looser way uh, as a synonym for the climate crisis or a synonym for today. And the more it's used, the less clear uh, it becomes. And that worries me. I note uh, that the United Nations has started to use the term uh, Anthropocene uh, in its most recent uh, human development report. Um, so that's the concept. Those are the debates uh, as I see it. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll now stop sharing my screen. And it's time for Q&A. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I have uh, read some questions that um, I will say you. The first uh, one is of Jaqueline Vieira, yes. And the, her question is, what is the reason for the Earth system scientists 
to not include in the discussions about stratigraphic debates the phase of primitive accumulation of the capitalism, like argued by Annette Zing and Jason Moore. And summing up uh, why the stratigraphic, stratigraphic debate are resistant to include the hypothesis of the capitalocene, yeah? So, um, you know, debates about the capitalocene uh, are <clears throat> widespread within the uh, community of uh, humanistic scholars and social science scholars, but not amongst the uh, geologists. Um, <clears throat> they are not concerned with causation. It doesn't matter to them that uh, whatever causes might lie behind the transition between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods, whether that's an asteroid or whether it's something else, it doesn't matter. They are concerned with um, a f finding and specifying uh, a moment uh, in time and a boundary within the rock after which things are different. And why that happened is much, much less interesting to them. And it's the same with the Anthropocene. They are looking to find a boundary, a before and after in rock or ice. And they want to be able to uh, explain uh, what makes before different from after, but they are not concerned with why that change took place. That's not uh, an important consideration uh, in stratigraphy. And so the debates about the capitalist scene or um, any of the other Ocenes um, are not terribly interesting to the majority of the Anthropocene working group. Um, as a historian, I probably pay more attention to these than maybe anybody else. I'm not sure I should be careful about that claim because uh, there's a lawyer in the Anthropocene working group. There is a historian of science, um, but for the geologists there, all, all that is really beside the point. Mm -hmm. There is a question of uh, Clara Marx. Uh, he asked, it's a mistake to talk in uh, agricultural revolution instead of uh, agricultural transition from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. Um, is, it, is it a mistake to, to speak of an agricultural revolution? Instead of uh, an agricultural transition. Transition, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say uh, by and large, yes, and that the term transition is better, mainly because uh, the process in every case, and there are at least seven independent transitions to agriculture in world history, and there might be more than seven. In every case, it, it was a very gradual process that took um, at least centuries and maybe uh, millennia. So that's an argument for using the word transition rather than revolution. The one argument for using the word revolution is the significance of it. It's such a gigantic change, uh, such a momentous change uh, in human history. And as it turns out uh, in uh, the history of life uh, and the history of the planet. So, if you conceive of the word revolution as meaning sudden, then no. If you conceive of the word revolution meaning significant, then maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, position is safer. Mm -hmm. uh, Pamela Oliveira uh, asked, uh, would you like to know a little more about why you disagree 
with Lewis and Maslin theory, yes? And do you think that that has to do also with this resistance about uh, uh, arguments based on historical claims? Okay, here's why I disagree with uh, Lewis and Maslin. So um, they uh, emphasize a, um, uh, a brief uh, uh, shift in carbon dioxide concentrations that focuses uh, on the year 1610. They make an argument that what happened in the American hemisphere after 1492 uh, was so uh, gigantic and consequential that it changed the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's climate. And the substance of their argument is that a radical loss of population took place in the Americas. And uh, as a consequence of that, more um, vegetation grew up, forests uh, grew up, uh, absorbing carbon from the atmosphere um, and uh, cooling the climate. Okay, that's their argument. The reason I uh, don't go along with it is uh, while I agree that they're absolutely right about the drastic loss of population in the American hemisphere from maybe 50, 60, 70 million people in 1492 to maybe 5 million people in 1650. But this does not necessarily mean that um, forest area uh, increased uh, in proportion to the decrease in human population. And the reason for that is at the same time, uh, grazing animals that had never existed in the Americas were also introduced. Uh, horses, cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, all of them eating uh, vegetation. And at the same time, as some reforestation was taking place in the Americas, accelerated deforestation was probably taking place in the big centers of population in uh, Eurasia, particularly in uh, Southern China and Northern India, which are not even considered in the Lewis and Maslin argument. They pay attention only to the American hemisphere, whereas uh, atmospheric chemistry responds to global changes in um, the proportion of carbon in the biosphere, not just to the American hemisphere. So I think they've ignored two important variables. And if you look specifically at the ice core record, uh, it shows only very modest uh, alterations uh, between 1492 and uh, 1700, and the various uh, spikes are probably related more to volcanoes than to other variables. So I'm not impressed uh, with that part of Lewis and Maslin's argument. Mm -hmm. There is also a question of Marlon Reis. Uh, he would like to know if you think that the Anthropocene debates produce a new historical consciousness by which our own perspective of historical time is affected. I hope so. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure that we can say just yet. Um, but I think there are initial signs that suggest that the debates surrounding the Anthropocene are going to affect uh, historians' understanding of history and of periodization. Um, I would not say that this has happened, but I think there are signs that 
it might be happening and that a larger and larger proportion of historians are prepared to see the global environment as a defining uh, element in human history, which up to this point, historians have not been willing to see that. Only a few environmental historians might argue that, but the great majority of historians know. Um, but more and more historians, not just environmental historians, are taking environmental change seriously. And the reason for that is the obvious uh, dramatic scale, scope, and pace of environmental change in the last 75 years or so, that is the Anthropocene. So I think it may well be happening, but we don't have to check back in a million years, but maybe in 50 years. Mm -hmm. O Álvaro Andrei Tedesco da Silva, ele pergunta, eh, do the previous geological eras were defined with the same precision or were measured by an approximation in centuries, millennium? Do you think that if we use a broader measurement, it will be easier yes, to define the Anthropocene as a geological epoch. Yeah, so the earlier uh, intervals of geological time are defined using the same methods, but, uh, and with as much precision as possible, but mm. less precision The further back in time you go, the less precision uh, there is. Uh, and in fact, the geologists are always making small adjustments and changing the, the, the date of the uh, boundary between the Eocene and uh, the Paleocene and uh, all the others. These are constantly being tweaked and are readjusted uh, slightly. And so from this point of view, what's the difference between 1945 and 1784? A uh, hundred years, 200 years is nothing. Yeah. Geologically speaking, is nothing. <laughs> exactly. So um, in, in some respect, Some of the argument about the, the birthday of the Anthropocene uh, is, is trivial from the geological uh, perspective. But it's the way the, the stratigraphers operate is they want to have the maximum precision that they can get. And if circumstances allow greater precision, then they should have greater precision. And if there is going to be an Anthropocene, it can have greater precision. So they should have greater precision. So that is why the um, stratigraphers actually are arguing about whether 1945 or uh, some earlier date is a better one. Even though it, the earlier boundaries are all fuzzy and, and not nearly so precise. Mm -hmm. É, Adriano de Lavor, ele tem uma, Adriano de Lavor has a very interesting question. Yes, to what extent uh, the great pandemics such as we are experiencing right now uh, are relevant to the confirmation of the Anthropocene? Do you see any possible relation? Uh, yes, I do, and I'm not the only one. Um, Many people commenting on the uh, current pandemic uh, make the case that it is uh, a reflection of the Anthropocene in the sense that it's a reflection of the intensity of disruption in um, the natural world, human disruption, in the natural world, that the more disruption, the more involvement that humans have uh, 
with other life forms, the greater the probability of um, zoonotic spillover, the greater the probability of diseases such as COVID-19, which uh, originate with uh, a coronavirus uh, that is uh, indigenous, you might say, to uh, a certain species of bat, uh, horseshoe bats. So the, the probability of such infections is greater when the intensity of human disruption of natural ecosystems is greater. So therefore the current pandemic is a reflection of the Anthropocene. And it is logical to expect a greater frequency of similar pandemics uh, as the Anthropocene proceeds, other things being equal. O Rodrigo Ramiro Dado has a, a question. Uh, he, he asks, uh, as a political concept, it does it matter the formalization of the Anthropocene as a geological epoch or his role as a warning, yes, as a moral warning for the behavior change is much more important, yes? Yeah. Um... Politically speaking, the, the formal recognition within geology of the Anthropocene uh, is probably not terribly significant. It is the cultural adoption of the concept of the Anthropocene, not necessarily the word Anthropocene, but the concept, the recognition that uh, human beings, maybe some much more than others, uh, have uh, interfered in uh, natural processes, have interfered in uh, the Earth's governing biogeochemical cycles. That recognition is what is important politically. And the formal recognition of a new interval of geological time, much, much, much less uh, significant. And the yeah. public recognition is growing uh, every day, regardless of what the geologists decide. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question of uh, Caminho's group. Uh, they th uh, he thanks for, he or she thanks for your presentation and ask if the current model of civilization and urban arrangements are sustainable without a cataclysm risk for the humanity. How could we change this? <laughs> this is a one million <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say very few of the current arrangements are sustainable in a strict sense uh, and um, urban conglomerations uh, are among the least sustainable arrangements that we have. They depend on massive influxes from surrounding uh, hinterlands. I mean, every day, um, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo import massive amounts of water, food, uh, energy uh, from other parts of Brazil and other parts of the world. And the same is true of every big city uh, around the world. They, they impose a tax, so to speak, uh, on the natural world surrounding them. They have a global footprint, an urban footprint, uh, or as it's sometimes put, an urban metabolism uh, that is uh, very difficult to sustain in the long run. Uh, how can that be addressed? Um, the first component of that, in my view, uh, is the Earth's energy system. Uh, and the highest priority 
uh, at the moment is to retire fossil fuels and find a new set of uh, arrangements for energy that is um, sustainable, that's based on renewable energy uh, and in which fossil fuels play a much, 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 much diminished role. That's the most urgent priority in public policy around the world today. Nothing else is as important in my view. Mm -hmm. um, a second uh, priority, which is um, interesting from the point of view of urban uh, sustainability is uh, human population. So human population is still growing. The growth rate peaked around 1968 or 1970. It's been in decline since then. It would be uh, easier to achieve sustainability if uh, human population growth uh, leveled off and was zero. Urbanization actually is a good thing from that point of view because urban populations reproduce at uh, much slower rates than rural populations. This has been true always and everywhere in world history and probably will be true uh, always and everywhere in the future. So urbanization uh, has a dampening effect on fertility and therefore in that one respect uh, makes sustainability a little easier to achieve. So there's some interesting complexities here. But my biggest point is the energy system is the dominant component of unsustainability and changing that is the highest priority towards sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, a lot of authors uh, draws attention to this gap between the consciousness and the political action, yes? How you see this uh, in a historical point of view? Yeah, it's an interesting problem. Um, on the one hand, in the general sense, political action always derives from consciousness. People do not take political action without having goals in mind. Uh, on the other hand, uh, consciousness in some instances uh, doesn't do much for political action. Why should that be the case? So there are probably many, many, many reasons. Um, one of them is time scale and uh, urgency. So people can be conscious of things like the current pandemic that uh, bring acute and immediate problems and demand uh, immediate uh, political action. And by and large, uh, the pandemic has gotten uh, immediate political action, although lots and lots of uh, controversies and uh, irrational political decisions, I admit all that. But the urgency of it uh, has uh, generated political action. There are other kinds of uh, issues that people can be conscious of that are not so urgent or do not seem so urgent. And historically, climate change has been in this category. And biodiversity loss has been in this category. Scientists and the general public have been aware of both issues for many decades, but none of them seems to be a problem today or tomorrow, it's later. And so consciousness does not drive political action with any urgency. Although with respect to climate change, I believe that is changing and the sense of urgency is building. I certainly hope so but I also mm -hmm. need to be the case. Uh, so this is one important variable accounting for a discrepancy between consciousness and political action. 
And another is self-interest. Um, most of us are to some degree uh, hypocritical in the sense that while we would like to see problems solved, we don't necessarily want to see them solved if it comes at any cost to us personally uh, or our families. And this is also important in uh, global environmental uh, issues and climate change issues uh, in particular. And uh, until the pandemic, uh, I certainly think that, this, that I could be accused of this. Uh, I used to fly around the world and four or five times a year, I would, well, two or three times a year, I would fly from North America to somewhere else. And it was important to me professionally to go to meetings, but that's a, a big part of my carbon footprint. So that's a bit of hypocrisy on my part. And there are millions of people for whom the same was true. I, I've stayed home during the pandemic. I, my carbon footprint is much smaller. What will happen after the pandemic? Will I reduce my hypocrisy? Will I fly? Will I not fly? Remains to be seen. But I have a feeling that my old patterns of hypocrisy uh, will return at least partly. Mm -hmm. And that I will not be alone in that. Yeah, this is another point, yes, between the individual behavior and political measures as well. Yes, it's complex. Lucas Jaime has uh, puts a question. What is the religious understanding about the Anthropocene? <laughs> religious understanding? Yeah. Yeah. If you have something to say about this, yes. That's an interesting question to which I do not have a good answer. I am dimly aware of discussions about the Anthropocene in, in some uh, communities, uh, religiously defined communities, particularly here in the United States, uh, what we call old line uh, churches. So the long established churches like the Presbyterian Church, Anglican Church, Baptist Church, etc. Um, in which some uh, active members of these communities are talking about the Anthropocene and talking about stewardship, talking about responsibility. But I'm only dimly aware of this I don't think it's a dominant strain of discourse within these religious communities. And I'm not aware of what's, what may be going on within uh, Islam, within Hinduism, Buddhism, and other major uh, world religious traditions. So it's an interesting question. I don't know enough to answer it properly. Mm -hmm. Daniele Macedo uh, asked about uh, the contribution of agriculture to the Anthropocene. If you could talk about the contribution of meat consumption, it's relevant to the Anthropocene because some data showed that part of agricultural production for animal feeds. Yeah, it is relevant, uh, in my view, to the Anthropocene. First, agriculture in general. If you take uh, William Rutterman's perspective, it, it is early agriculture that is responsible for the Anthropocene. If you take the Anthropocene working group's viewpoint, agriculture is less important, but it's still a significant component of the dramatic scale, scope, and pace of modern environmental change. It's a significant component of the changes to the governing biogeochemical cycles. Take the nitrogen cycle, for example. The biggest changes to the nitrogen cycle derive from the use of nitrogenous fertilizer uh, 
uh, in recent decades. Uh, and agriculture is the biggest variable for the nitrogen cycle. Within that, um, the industrial scale production of uh, meat uh, is a large subset of the agriculture industry that is relevant to global environmental change and relevant to uh, atmospheric chemistry, both in terms of carbon and in terms of methane. The industrial scale production of cattle and hogs or pigs. Uh, I don't know the numbers, what proportion of uh, carbon dioxide emissions and methane emissions uh, result from the feedlots of industrial agriculture, but it's a non-negligible uh, proportion. And it's pretty easy to research. So yes, yes and yes, agriculture and within that um, meat production are uh, non-negligible components of the set of environmental changes that comprise the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. What do you think that is the importance of the concept of the Anthropocene uh, in, face, in the face of climate denialism uh, by the anthropogenic chains? And at the, in the same process, some companies like ExxonMobil are changing from denial to geoengineering solution. Yes. What is your opinion about that? Yeah. So it could be that the whole discussion around the Anthropocene uh, is helping to reduce climate denialism. Maybe. I, it's hard to know why people and organizations that 10 years ago were climate denialists today are, are not. And there are some examples of that. Um, but um, I think it's, it's not impossible to think that the general cultural discussion uh, of the Anthropocene is uh, partly responsible. Now, how significant is that? How significant is the uh, alleged change in the position of uh, big companies like ExxonMobil? Um, I'm a little cautious uh, in this because there has been a lot of um, what we call in English greenwashing on the part of uh, corporations. That is a, a facade of environmental consciousness, which is a mask behind which their traditional behavior is maintained. And it could be that ExxonMobil is indulging in the same thing. I remember, for example, it might have been almost 20 years ago when another massive oil company, uh, BP, British Petroleum, proclaimed that it now its initials stood for beyond petroleum and that it was going to become uh, a green energy company. And it hasn't really happened. Uh, BP still remains mainly a fossil fuel uh, company. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that ExxonMobil will for at least another uh, 20 years. There's a big French energy company called Engie, which historically was a fossil fuel company and now maintains that it's uh, going to lead the energy transition into renewables. And I hope that that's sincere. I hope it's real. Um, but it remains to be seen how sincere these conversions are. And ultimately, all those corporations are responsible to their shareholders. And if they're not making money in a transition to renewable energy, they are not really going to do it. Now, I actually think that 
they will be making money in a transition to uh, renewable energy. Uh, but that for them is a requirement. There is a question of uh, Ricardo. Uh, he states that in your book, The Great Acceleration, you point out the some possibilities of socialism, Soviet Union, China, for global environmental degradation. Would this be contradictory to the capitalist scene argument? Well, uh, not necessarily, uh, but it is something that uh, people who make the capitalist scene argument uh, tend to ignore um, for obvious reasons. Uh, <clears throat> assuming that you agree that the Soviet Union was not capitalist, uh, then the rather dramatic environmental degradation that took place uh, in the Soviet Union does not easily fit with the capitalist scene uh, narrative, but it's not necessarily contradictory. One can argue that the majority of modern global environmental disruption has taken place within one or another capitalist system. And only a minority of it has taken place within the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China and so you can claim with some logic that uh, the global environmental disruptions of modern time are primarily generated within the capitalist system. You cannot say they're exclusively generated within the capitalist system. That's just empirically incorrect. Um, but uh, it, it does raise the issue of whether or not there's something deeper, something bigger going on that makes both capitalism and Soviet and Chinese communism disruptive uh, environmentally. And I think there's some value in that perspective, which to me brings us to, uh, again, the, the energy system primarily. Whether that energy system is organized by the Soviet Union or whether it's organized by a capitalist uh, United States or a capitalist Brazil, as long as it use, uses fossil carbon in massive amounts, it has the same effect on atmospheric chemistry and on the climate. So from that perspective, this socioeconomic system underlying environmental change, uh, uh, it may not be the most important variable. The, the techno social system, uh, the energy system um, is the most important variable. But um, to answer the question specifically, I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in the capitalist scene argument that both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China had their fair share maybe more than their fair share of environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. And let me say one last thing about this. The People's Republic of China, nominally uh, communist, and it's run by the Chinese Communist Party, but um, to what extent is that non-capitalist? Um, you know, since the 1990s, uh, it's looked more and more capitalist. It's like, a Chinese capitalism, a state capitalism. State capitalism, exactly. Um, but at some point, and it's hard to say exactly when, um, the Chinese system you know, became less obviously communist and more and more capitalist. That was not mm -hmm. for the Soviet Union. Okay. There is an interesting question of Alessandra. Uh, she questions if there is a relation between the rising of the far-right political movements and the Anthropocene epoch. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, that is an interesting question. I would say there's probably a connection, but a weak connection. Uh, the reason I say there, there probably is a connection is that some of the rise of far right movements is, I think, motivated by frustration with and antipathy against environmentalism. The efforts to restrict the freedom of action of business, um, the efforts to regulate the behavior of ordinary citizens. You know, here in the United States, for example, there are people who feel that if I want to drive a big, heavy vehicle, I should be free to do so, regardless of the fuel efficiency of that vehicle. And I don't want to be told by any government that I can't do that. So I think that some anti-environmentalism in the recent surge of uh, far-right politics. Um, but it, what's at the heart of it is anti-regulation and environmentalism is only one piece of that. But the reason I say it's a weak connection is because I think there are other things that are far uh, stronger in generating the uh, rise of far-right politics. That it might not be the case in Brazil, but uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States, um, I think that uh, immigration is much more important as a um, spark to far-right politics. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's not a big issue uh, in Brazil. I'll, I, I think I should not speculate about the rise of far-right politics in Brazil because everybody on this call knows more about it than I do. <laughs> but at any rate, and it could be, now that I said I won't speculate about Brazil, it could be that within Brazil, anti-environmentalism is a bigger component of the rise of far-right politics because there are lots of Brazilians who, for example, don't wish to be told that uh, limiting the deforestation of the Amazon uh, is uh, necessary in the interests of humanity. Um, I think you know, your president has voiced this sentiment uh, mm -hmm. time to time. But elsewhere in the world, I, I think the connection it exists, but is weak to modest uh, in significance. Mm -hmm. um, we have still some uh, three questions. Yes, I think that uh, we, uh, we can uh, stop with the questions because we have only 15 minutes, unfortunately. And I have a question of Lucas Jaime. Uh, he questions if the if it's real that the concept of the Anthropocene is a fight against the modernity. Yes. And I will also put the question of Washington Galvão. If you see uh, the indigenous and traditional people notions of uh, land management as a solution for the damage caused by the Anthropocene regarding natural resource economic exploitation. Okay, um, so is the Anthropocene argument a, a, a fight against, uh, a struggle against modernity? Um, it, it could be, but it isn't necessarily. Um, it is obviously the, uh, the trends of, of modernity that have, um, well, I won't say obviously. In my understanding, in which the Anthropocene is a very recent phenomenon, 75 years old or so, uh, 
it is obviously the trends of modernity that are responsible for it. If, if on the other hand, you believe in an early Anthropocene, then modernity is not so relevant to it. But I don't believe in the early Anthropocene. Um, nonetheless, the arguments uh, in favor of recognizing the Anthropocene, recognizing the severity and impact of human action upon the global environment is not necessarily an anti-modern uh, argument. It's a, an argument for a different kind of modernity. In fact, you might say an even more modern modernity if, like me, you argue that the most important reform is to the energy system, uh, a more, I would say, advanced uh, energy system uh, that marginalizes fossil fuels. Um, that's not anti-modern. Um, that is technological uh, and it could be capitalist. Uh, it's fully compatible with modernity, I would say. The second part are indigenous uh, land use, or if I may, indigenous resource use systems uh, a potential answer for the problem uh, of the Anthropocene? Well, uh, potentially yes, but I would say uh, realistically, by which I really mean politically, no. Uh, potentially yes, because uh, if we dismantled uh, modern technology, modern energy systems in particular, uh, and uh, used resources the way that uh, indigenous peoples have done for thousands of years, uh, the human footprint would be far, far smaller than it is. Climate would uh, gradually stabilize and the disruptions that we call the Anthropocene would be minimized. But there are at least two problems uh, that prevent that. One is indigenous uh, resource use uh, intensity is practical with um, small populations. It's not practical with 8 billion people. And it's probably not practical with 1 billion people, although we can't really be sure. Uh, so that's a big problem uh, to which there's no uh, obvious acceptable solution. And then secondly, not unrelatedly, um, very few of the people uh, on earth who do not now live like indigenous people want to live like indigenous people. Um, and so uh, making a, a transition to uh, styles of life and levels of resource use compatible with the traditions of indigenous people, that's politically um, just unrealistic. Um, so I don't regard that as a likely uh, solution. Mm -hmm. We have a, 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 a very good question of uh, Alex Solorzano. Uh, what non declensionist narratives can the Anthropocene offer? Or is the Anthropocene narrative necessarily that of humans reshaping and destroying the planets? Uh, <coughs> So I would say that uh, for the majority of people involved in Anthropocene debates and discourse, uh, the whole story is predominantly uh, one of uh, degradation so far. However, I would also say uh, 
that is not exclusively a declensionist story uh, in the following sense. Um, people, uh, a, a billion, two billion people live much more comfortably than anybody anywhere lived 200 years ago. People on average live twice as long as any population anywhere lived 200 years ago. Part of this is because <clears throat> many of us, most of us now exploit the natural environment more effectively than we did 200 years ago. So our comfort, our uh, longevity is connected to the exploitations of nature of the Anthropocene. So it is declensionist as regards the environment. It's not so declensionist as regards human longevity, health, uh, and comfort. Although I want to emphasize these things are unevenly distributed among the human race. Uh, and we always have to remember that. Nextly, um, there are within the Anthropocene scholarly community, a minority <clears throat> who argue for what they sometimes call the good Anthropocene, which is a, a, a techno-optimist outlook, which says in effect that uh, human beings exercise tremendous accidental influence over the global environment. That's uh, got many unfortunate aspects to it, but we can fix it. We just have to get better at influencing the global environment. We don't have to do it less, we have to do it smart. And we can do this. We can geoengineer the planet. Now, as I've already said, I'm, I'm anxious about this uh, because of unintended consequences. As a historian, I'm very attuned to unintended consequences of human actions undertaken for the best of intentions. Um, and some undertaken not for the best of intentions. But my views aside, uh, there are scholars and scientists. Um, there's one in, in the Anthropocene Working Group who are pretty optimistic about the Anthropocene and think that it, it's a manageable uh, problem, a manageable phenomenon and um, the human race is capable of techno-management of the Earth system. As I say, I'm uh, sharply skeptical uh, of this myself, but some people see it this way, and for them, there really is no declensionist component of this. Uh, this is going to be, as they see it, a cheerful story of progress. Uh, in the long run. Uh, to me, that's by no means clear. Um, so those are some of the angles of vision that one can take about a declensionist narrative and the Anthropocene. I have a last question that I would like to hear very much from you, yes? What change do you think that the Anthropocene concept brings to the historical writing in the environmental history? Do you think that the Anthropocene as a concept of a geological epoch provoked by the global human imprint provokes change in the way how we practice, how we write history in the environmental history? Not necessarily. In some respects, environmental historians for 50 years have been writing about the Anthropocene without using the word. 
Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. Environmental historians have been conscious of this, the radical scale, scope, and pace of environmental change, both locally and globally. Uh, in some respects, environmental historians haven't needed the Anthropocene discourse to see the world uh, as they see it. I remember, for example, when I first read what's now a fairly famous article uh, by Dipesh Chakrabarti uh, called Four Theses. Uh, it appeared in an obscure journal called Critical Inquiry, uh, in which he was arguing that uh, historians now have to take global environmental change seriously. And when I read it, I thought, well, environmental historians have been saying this uh, since I was a student, which is quite a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I found it rather frustrating that Chakrabarti was, was uh, as if it were new. Um, so in some respects, I think environmental historians are less affected by Anthropocene discourse than other arenas of uh, scholarly and scientific uh, inquiry. However, I think that Anthropocene discourse might make environmental historians more attuned to the global and uh, less attuned to the local. Or not, maybe not necessarily less attuned to the local, but attuned to the local in larger global context. Mm -hmm. And a lot of environmental history writing uh, in recent decades is intensely local. And the Anthropocene discourse, I think, makes it more and more logical, more and more tempting, and in fact, more and more easy to contextualize every local story in larger Anthropocene uh, global stories. I can't say that that's clearly happening within environmental history, but my, my impression is that it is happening. And it's also my view that that's an improvement, an intellectual mm -hmm. improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, John, for your talk, for your session. It was marvelous to hear you so clear, yes. I am sure that uh, the audience enjoyed as well, yes. Uh, I will give some, some uh, information concerning the next session, yes, but I would like to uh, thank you very, very much for your availability, yes, for the acceptance of our invitation, yes. Thank you very much, yes. It was a brilliant opening talk to your course, yes. And, uh, Pessoal, eu queria pedir, é, teve um erro aí na questão do link, né, da aula, é, na verdade, cada aula vai ser um link, tá, então nós já colocamos ali no, no, no chat o link da tarde, e quem está inscrito vai receber por e-mail os links das aulas dos próximos dias, tá. É, quero agradecer muito a participação de vocês, as, as perguntas, as questões foram excelentes, e lembrar que agora, às duas horas, nós teremos a sessão com o professor Zoltan Botchar-Simon, é, da Universidade de Bielefeld, e espero que vocês estejam aqui para a gente continuar o debate. Desde já, muito obrigado.